In our next section, we move towards the conclusion of events in Mitchell County, with trials for both Goss and the riot leaders being scheduled and held, along with attempts to bring some sense of calm and normalcy back to Spruce Pine. We begin our journey in this section on Friday, October 5, 1923. That day begins with a brief flurry of back-and-forth discussion between Solicitor Hayes, Judge Finley, and Governor Morrison. Finley starts things off with a cable to Morrison, asking him to consider setting the special court term in Mitchell County for October 29th. Finley stated that he had consulted with Solicitor Johnson J. Hayes and other parties, I'm assuming those were the Mitchell County officials, and that all felt that date would work better for everyone. Plus, the delay to October 29th would save the special term of court in Avery County that was already scheduled and crammed full of cases to be heard. Solicitor Hayes follows up with another telegram to Morrison, stating what Finley had already sent, that the special term for Mitchell County should be postponed until October 29th. Hayes argues both cost and convenience, plus saving the special term in Avery County, were important factors to consider. That is not what Governor Morrison wants to hear from Finley and Hayes. He had stated that he wanted court to meet October 22nd with Finley presiding and Hayes trying the cases, and that it would be held that way. His telegram reads, quote, Do hope a solicitor will comply with my request about Mitchell Court, keeping troops there immensely costly to state. Absolutely necessary to keep troops there until court convenes as it now appears. Please let me hear from you, and I hope very much that you and Solicitor Hayes can comply with my request, unquote. Maybe a little politically tinged vernacular here, he refers to Hayes as Solicitor at the beginning of the message. Hayes is a Republican. Finley is a Democrat. And Morrison, the Democrat, wants everyone to line up with him, and he's counting on his party mate to rein in the solicitor and force him to acquiesce to the governor's request. Finley gets the message, and in a short reply basically says, We'll do what you say, boss. So, October 22nd is set as the date for Goss's trial on the assault charge. That's just three weeks after he was captured and taken to Raleigh. There is no mention of the trials for the mob members who were arrested. The Asheville Citizen prints a story on October 5th where they attempt to deal with rumors and statements made in print by various news sources over the previous week. Some items of note in the piece. They walk back some of the sensationalistic reporting, stating that there was exaggeration of some of the events and of the true condition in Spruce Pine. They call out the reports of between 200 and 300 African Americans being deported on the train. They call that number to not over 75, which is a bit low if the women and children from the shantytown are included. That number does likely represent the number of male workers who were put on the train. Next, they state that there was no doubt that the mob numbered between 75 and 90 men, and we will see in a bit how close that estimate is. They also point to the youth of the mob members and state that they truly perform their actions in an ugly manner. The citizen reporters cite that many residents they talked to described the mob as hoodlums, lawbreakers, and roughnecks, and they condemned and denounced their actions. No particular individuals were identified in this story. Charles Webb, one of the owners of the Asheville Citizen, traveled to Spruce Pine to see what was going on for himself. He shared his remarks in the paper. Quote, There has been no parading of long-haired mountaineers with red bandanas around their necks. Neither have the so-called deserters of the Confederacy appeared in evidence. There has not been a state of siege or of mild martial law, as some newspapers would make it appear. Unquote. Webb says that about half the African Americans sent away had returned to work, and that number, 35 or so, seems about spot on based on tallying up those returning that was mentioned in other stories. Webb concluded his article by stating that, quote, Spruce Pine is as quiet and as peaceful as it ever was, as I see it, and if it were not for the troops on guard and patrol duty, a stranger here would not know anything unusual had happened, unquote. 
The Charlotte Observer reported on October 5th that Governor Morrison had announced that John Goss would be tried October 22nd for the assault of Alice Thomas. The governor emphasized in the article that Goss would be, quote, ensured a fair trial and protection when he returns to the county, unquote. Now, we'll talk some more about that later. However, Morrison refused to say if troops would stay in Spruce Pine until after the trial. Ben Dixon McNeil files yet another brief in which a rumor that a Ku Klux Klan organizer had shown up in Spruce Pine was mentioned. He states that no KKK representative had ever been in this section of the mountains. Application cards for the KKK had been seen around town with a cost of $10 to join. That's $173 in today's money. The KKK organizer was never found. McNeil said that a plea for amnesty for the mob members had been issued by some unknown individuals. The plea stated that the members would refrain from further acts against African Americans and would offer to sign an agreement to abstain from disorders. Now, in an interesting side note, McNeil stated that the hydroelectric dam at the Tow River at Mempro was experiencing low water levels due to a drought in the region, and this was forcing electricity and spruce pine to go off at 10 p.m. and stay off until after midnight when the river flow caught back up enough to allow electricity generation. We move on to Saturday, October 6, 1923. Metz is on the KKK story immediately after the NNO published it. He sends a telegram immediately to Morrison stating that the National Guard had not been seeking out a KKK organizer that was rumored to be in the town, and he had some strong words for the reporter McNeil. Quote, McNeil's information to this effect is not correct and no excuse for this statement. Wish you talk to King Associated Press, get him give this statement state papers. Tell Gordon Smith, say to Frank Smithers, that McNeil had no such knowledge or right to so state, unquote. Morrison's response to Metz about the KKK, quote, Don't fool with Ku Klux, none of our business, unquote. Cameron Morrison. However, there is one final last-ditch effort to get Governor Morrison to make a change in the special session of court from October 22nd to October 29th. This request comes from a group of lawyers in the district where Mitchell and Avery County Court was held. They sent a telegram that said that Judge Finley had asked him to plead for the date change as it would require a, quote, continuance of the entire civil docket, unquote, in Avery County. They also pointed out that there was a two-week period beginning October 29th in which no court is scheduled anywhere in the district and there was no conflicts to be adjusted. But this plea fell on deaf ears by the governor. Now to Sunday, October 7th, 1923. The Bristol Herald Courier reported that Peter Biddicks and E.L. Green appeared before Justice of the Peace Bennett on October 6th to answer for their September arrest on inciting rebellion by circulating the petition to remove A.N. Fuller from office. After their appearance, Bennett dismissed those charges placed against the two men. The Charlotte Observer published a piece that carried a statement from the Mitchell Banner, the newspaper in Bakersville, that commented on the recent press coverage of the race riot. This from the Banner, quote, Recent events in the exaggerated and to a large extent misleading and false reports sent out of Spruce Pine during the past week, notably to the Raleigh and Charlotte papers, has done more to injure and blacken the reputation and block the progress and development of Mitchell than can be remedied and counteracted by the natives in many years, unquote. The Charlotte Observer responded that it had no sensational reporter on the scene and that it was careful to defend the charter of the people of Mitchell County and that it had not reproached the county as being a stronghold of black republicanism. The paper concluded that the banner needs to tear off a strip from the blanket arraignment that it was moved to make in its wrath, unquote. The Goldsboro News printed a piece that weekend stating that, in its opinion, the African Americans should be removed from Mitchell County. In the article, the paper states that North Carolina had done its duty demonstrating its right and power to protect individuals in their deployment of the National Guard. It concluded, quote, 
it can do no one any good to keep them at work under guard of troops, unquote, and that the African Americans would not be there if they were free to leave, and there is no need to keep them there both against their own will and the will of the community. Finally, the Statesful Landmark became the first press agency to call for a change of venue for John Goss's trial. In the words of the paper, quote, It is our private opinion, publicly expressed, and if the trial is to rise above the grade of a farce, it should be held outside Mitchell County. There is no danger that a Negro who attacks a white woman will not get all that is coming to him in any county in North Carolina, but with the feeling against all Negroes, and this particular Negro in Mitchell County, the accused would stand small show of a fair trial there." We now turn to Monday, October 8, 1923. On that day, Colonel D.W. Adams wired Governor Morrison, requesting that he leave one-half the National Guard Company from Concord in Spruce Pine until after the Bakersfield trial. Adams said this request was being made after he consulted with General Metz. He gave several reasons, including threats against civil officers, protection for the African-American laborers, and less costs with only half a company present. Governor Morrison also received another letter from the Clinchfield Products Corporation. In this one, they alerted him to their plans to try and bring back their men that were deported on the train back to work for the Hawkins and Wiseman Mines. The company was asking Morrison to write Governor Wilson Harvey of South Carolina, requesting that the Clinchfield Products Company be allowed to reach out to the men and their families in South Carolina and ask them to come back to work. Without that approval, the company said they would not be able to send their men to try and convince the workers to come back. There is no evidence that Morrison attempted this contact for the company. Next is one of the most consequential finds we discovered when working on this project. It's a letter from Jason E. Burleson. Burleson was most likely the richest man in Mitchell County at the time and was a prominent citizen. As we mentioned earlier, he served stints in the State House and Senate in Raleigh. We want to share this letter with you in its entirety, especially with its insights into how the county worked, and share his suggestions to Morrison on what he should do to remedy the situation. Plus, he asked it to stay confidential. Oh well, here it goes. Dear Governor, I went to Kings Mountain Saturday to see you, and when I got there, the mayor told me that he had received a telegram from you that you wouldn't be there. You know I live in Spruce Pine, and I was in Atlanta when the trouble took place. I stay in Atlanta about half my time, but was up there all last week at the fair. What I'm writing you is confidential in my view of the situation with other good citizens. Now, I think that these men ought not to escape prosecution, because if they do, they will try the same thing over again, and I don't think they ought to be tried in the county of Mitchell, as I was in conversation with one of the sympathizers, and he stated it didn't differ. If they were indicted, they wouldn't get a jury that could convict them. I think when there is a true bill against these people, the suit ought to be moved to some other county that is not in sympathy with people that would start a mob that is uncalled for. The people that were into this are people that don't want to work, and they want to drive this labor away because they think they were working at a lower price than they would work for. I have employed a great many people in Spruce Pine all my life, and I know the disposition of people, and it has hurt the industry there a great deal, and it's going to keep men from investing in the mines, and all on account of this move. If these people are prosecuted, this will stop it, and anyone can take labor and work in peace, but if not, they will do the same thing again. Now, if these people are indicted, it might be that they would make a sworn statement that they wouldn't go into any other mob, that it would stop them. But the general rule of these people who were in this mob were people who are not worth much to the country, and a great many of them were boys led by a few old men. As I understand it, there was only eight or ten who lived in Spruce Pine that were into it. I talked to General Metz and Colonel Adams about the situation while I was up there. There had been another case of the same kind about six months ago in Tokane, which I thought the government or the state would take hold of, but they did not. They ran all the colored men off the county road who were building a road in the county seat. If they had been prosecuted, this thing would not have happened. Now, what I write is strictly confidential to you, as it would make enemies to me at this place, and I am confident that you will take the right view of the situation without saying anything. 
I thought as a citizen it was my duty to see you or write you. First time I am in Raleigh, I will call on you. Judge Clarkson, as you know, is a special friend of mine. If you go to the western part of the state at any time, let me know and I shall be more than glad to meet with you. With kindest regards, I remain very respectfully, J.E. Burleson. And in a big surprise, Governor Morrison announced on the evening of October 7th that the National Guard troops in Spruce Pine would be withdrawn. Morrison stated that, quote, In my opinion, the race trouble that had existed for 10 days had ended and normal conditions restored. He did confirm that troops would return for the special Superior Court term on October 22nd. We found no record of the decision-making that went on behind the call to remove troops so abruptly, and there was the request from D.W. Adams mentioned earlier that Morrison leave some troops in Spruce Pine. I'm guessing that cost of the state played a role since it was such a large response to the situation, but I don't see how overnight their protection of the African-American workers in the area would no longer be needed. And now Tuesday, October 9th. Fisk Carter Construction Company reached out to Morrison, asking him to leave a portion of the troops a little longer, stating that it, quote, will be very difficult to obtain labor if all the troops are removed, unquote. Note the handwritten no answer on the telegram here. I wonder if that's Morrison's handwriting. Metz now issues his final set of orders for the race right portion, special orders number 329. He orders the following groups to return to their home bases and they're relieved of further duty. The 105th Engineers, North Wilkesboro, Troop G, 2nd Squadron, 109th Cavalry, Hickory, Medical Detachment, 2nd Squadron, 109th Cavalry, Lincolnton, and Company E, 120th Infantry, Concord. Troop F, 2nd Squadron, 109th Cavalry, Asheville, and Company B, 105th Engineers, Morganton. Movement from Spruce Pine will be arranged by the Adjutant General's office in Raleigh, and troops can entrain to leave at noon. As the troops began loading the trains on the morning of October 9th, General Metz gave a brief address as the National Guard prepared to leave Spruce Pine. He praised the townspeople for cooperating with the military and urged them to open their hearts and country to what he called anxious capital used to develop Mitchell County's resources over the next few years. He stated that the African Americans were necessary for the kinds of work that could not be done if locals were depended on to do it. He noted that the farm life calls those available and there's no one else to do the ditching and similar tasks but the Negro. And with that, the National Guard was finished with their work in Spruce Pine. We move on to Wednesday, October 10, 1923. Colonel D.W. Adams now sent a memorandum of information to General Metz. I'm glad to report that up to this writing at 1 p.m. on October 10th, everything is quiet in Spruce Pine and that 12 out of the 15 rioters are under arrest. Preliminary hearing will be held before Sheriff W.J. Bennett and F.A. Carr this afternoon. We have on the town force five salaried deputies and 12 citizen special deputies. The sheriff has stationed special deputies at the camps of Porter and Boyd and at the camps of the O'Brien Construction Company. O'Brien has brought his labor back, but is keeping them in Avery County. He informed us yesterday that the sheriff of Avery County had given him two additional deputies. We will endeavor to keep you informed from time to time as to the progress of our affairs and again wish to thank you for the good work you did around Spruce Pine and by no means the least of which was your address before you left. We have heard many favorable comments about what you said and feel that it had a quieting effect. Efforts to deal with the rioters now began to take place. A special called session of the Spruce Pine Board of Aldermen was held October 10th that was attended by W.B. Kester, W.E. Lawfridge, Dr. T.W. Deaton, and Mayor A.N. Fuller. At the meeting, they discussed the arrests and the rioters taking place on that day. The town board, by a majority, voted to employ attorney E. Frank Watson of Burnsville and pay him the sum of $500, that's a little over $8,600 in today's money, to prosecute the defendants in the cases all through the courts. The town council further decided to take the matter up with Solicitor Johnson J. Hayes, North Carolina, and Mitchell County to see if they would pay the attorney fee agreed upon for the case. 
Now we're up to Thursday, October 11th, 1923. Arrests and indictments for rioting were announced on October 10th. Fourteen people, including a local minister, was arrested in Spruce Pine and charged with rioting and conspiracy in connection with the events surrounding the riot. The initial hearing with Justice of the Peace was free from disorders or demonstrations, and only one of the defendants took the stand, that being the Reverend Moulton Buchanan, who testified to the hearing that he was merely holding a gun for a man at the scene while that man went in search of ammunition for his gun. Only six of the 15 witnesses summoned by the state to this hearing went on the stand, one being Town Chief of Police Wright. Fifteen warrants were sworn out, but only twelve had been served by the time reports were submitted. One of the men who had been arrested, Logan Ward, disappeared before the hearing. The eleven bound over for court included Stokes McKinney, Peter Biddix, Jed Ward, Bot Buchanan, John Trippman, B.C. Jackson, Mac McMahon, the Reverend Moulton Buchanan, and Roby Buchanan. Bonds had been furnished by all but Bot Buchanan and Mac McMahon. Warrants were still outstanding for Pete Green Jr., DHS Tappan, and Fayette Ward. They had not been found in the first roundup of the men being arrested. Two attorneys were present for the hearing for those in the mob. Dr. James M. Peterson was the town counsel for Spruce Pine and is Dr. Charles Peterson's brother, while E. Frank Watson was the hired special prosecuting attorney. Watson is known for serving as a prosecutor for North Carolina in the 1929 Marion Mill Massacre trials. He is also the uncle of Frank Watson, a lawyer who practiced in Spruce Pine for decades. We now skip ahead to Wednesday, October 17, 1923. Planning for the trials was underway in mid-October when Sheriff R.C. Forbes reached out to Governor Morrison to inquire as to how John Goss was going to be transported from Raleigh to Bakersville for trial. Forbes asked if he was to come and accompany him back to the trial. Morrison replied on October 17th to keep it to yourself, but I am going to send, redacted, in custody of state troops when the time comes. You will note that Goss's name is marked through on this telegram. At the time it was retrieved, we were allowed to have a copy, but since his name was there and he was a prisoner, his records fell under special protection in the state archives, and no mention could be made of his name in any way on them. That has since been changed. Now we move to Friday, October 19, 1923, this just three days before the trial. Once again, General Metz swings into action. In Special Orders No. 346, he directs Major E.P. Robinson, Commanding Officer of Company A, 105th Engineers of North Wilkesboro, and the overall commander of the National Guard in Spruce Pine when they were stationed there beginning September 28th, to assemble his command and proceed to Hickory on October 20th, where the unit would meet authorities from the state prison along with John Goss and board a train for Tokane, North Carolina, where they would disembark and escort Goss to the Mitchell County courtroom for his trial. The detachment was ordered to be with Goss the entire time he was in Bakersville. Upon completion of the trial, the party would reboard the train and travel again to Hickory, where the National Guard unit would exit and others would continue on to Raleigh and the state prison. There were a total of 40 troops ordered out to accompany Goss to Bakersville. The day finally arrives for the trials. Goss travels uneventfully from Raleigh and arrives in Tokane on October 21st. He is taken from the train and the National Guard escorts him to Bakersville, bayonets affixed to the rifles. When Goss and the troops arrive in Bakersville, they discover the smoking ruins of a good part of the county seat. Bakersville had suffered a major fire just four days prior to the start of the trial. The fire had nothing to do with Goss's trial. It had been started by a couple of young men who were trying to cover up a robbery they had made at a local drugstore. The flames got out of control and burned several buildings in town. In fact, the roof of the Mitchell County Courthouse caught fire and someone jumped from a neighboring building onto the roof and put out the fire. For a complete rundown of that event, we do recommend you check out our July program presented by the Mitchell County Historical Society board member Bruce Coran. As the trial opened, an estimated crowd of 600 gathered at the courthouse to await the verdict. Locals said it was one of the largest crowds in Bakersville in years. Every seat was taken in the courtroom. 
Judge T.B. Finley began the proceedings at 10 a.m. with the appointment of S.J. Black, a Bakersville attorney, as Goss's counsel, and the work of seating the jury began. A total of 61 individuals were called for jury duty. The requirement was that they be from the Snow Creek area on back to the Tennessee line in northern Mitchell County in an effort to seat jurors who were unbiased or hadn't heard anything about the case, as if that was possible. An initial 36 jurors were summoned for Goss's trial. A number of these potential jurors were excused due to their opposition to capital punishment. At least eight were excused because they declared their opposition, while others were excused for forming and expressing an opinion, one for race prejudice, and one for a relationship with a principal state witness. The majority of the potential jurors were rejected by Black. When finished, the following men were seated on the jury. T.J. Mosley, Robert Davis, G.R. Snyder, Wilson Davis, Jason H. Googe, John M. Buchanan, J.H. Garland, Joe I. Buchanan, Jason B. Masters, B.F. Garland, Heck Ingram, and Sherman Hughes. After the jury was seated, Judge Finley delivered his charge to them for the case. The Asheville Citizen, which ran an extensive article on the trial, gave the following description of this oration, quote, Finley delivered a masterful charge in which he stressed the necessity of law enforcement, unquote. He challenged the jurors to, quote, give their best to their country, their duty to aid law enforcement, and the needs for a campaign of education against violence, unquote. Finley continued by declaring that the Ku Klux Klan seeks to explain its existence on the grounds of non-enforcement of the law, and he stated that such a system should be called upon that is contrary to all law. He defined the law as, quote, governing the assault on Mrs. Thomas and placed the bill of indictment in the hands of the grand jury, unquote. After completing the charge, Finley recessed the trial at noon until 3 p.m. that afternoon. When the trial resumed at 3 o'clock, Finley ordered all children under the age of 16 to leave the courthouse during testimony. Solicitor Johnson J. Hayes then began the case, calling the superintendent of the Mitchell County Convict Camp, whose identity we have not been able to discover during research, as the first witness. He testified about Goss's escape and identified him as the one who ran from the camp. Next, Hayes called Alice Thomas to the stand, where she was asked to describe the details of the assault. Thomas claimed she was stopped one half mile from her home on Googe's Creek and was assaulted under the fear of a large pocket knife. She then stepped down from the stand. Mrs. Melvina Silver, a neighbor of Alice Thomas, was called next by Hayes. She identified Goss as having stopped at her house a few minutes before he allegedly assaulted Mrs. Thomas. That's the jock, she declared in court, as she identified Goss. Hayes then declared that he had called all his witnesses and the defense was then allowed to begin their case. Attorney Black, who had only found out five and a half hours before that he was representing Goss, had no witnesses to call and for some reason he did not put Goss on the stand to defend himself. Therefore, testimony was ended and the jury was dismissed for deliberation. They took only five minutes before returning the verdict of guilty of assault, with Judge Finley immediately sentencing John Goss to death in the electric chair sometime between sunrise and sunset on November 30, 1923, for the crime. At some point during the day of the trial, Goss spoke with a representative of the Asheville Citizen. He stated that he was guilty of only an attempted assault. He expressed that he had proposed to plead guilty to attempted assault, but was advised against it by Black. At the same time, the plea would have required some sort of deal with Solicitor Hayes, and in the amount of time Black had to prepare to defend Goss, I doubt he had much opportunity to speak to him about a potential plea deal. Goss was asked how he felt knowing he was going to die. He answered, quote, I am prepared to meet God, unquote. He expressed appreciation to Governor Morrison in his efforts to protect him during the trial. He also praised his treatment at the state prison and the attitude of the troops who were his escorts from Tokane to Bakersville. The paper gave a physical description of Goss. He was described as being about 5 feet tall, weighing 125 pounds, coal black in appearance, and 44 years old. 
The citizen reported that there was no drama or sensational disclosures during the trial. The courtroom was described as being orderly and peaceful. With the Goss trial completed, the jury turned its attention to the man accused of inciting the riot. Solicitor Hayes then presented bills of indictment against the mob leaders. According to the Greensboro Daily News, 11 persons were put up for trial by the court for mob violence. Stokes McKinney, Peter Biddix, Joe Ward, Bob Buchanan, John Trippman, B.E. Jackson, Mac McMahon, Reverend Moulton Buchanan, Andrew Green, Lane Buchanan, and Roby Buchanan. Now on the left, you can see an example of one of those indictments. In our research, we have scanned all the indictments found that are in the county court records. We now have digital copies of them. The men were indicted on the following charge, quote, With force and arms did willfully and unlawfully conspire, confederate, and agree among themselves and with others to the jurors unknown to unlawfully assemble themselves together and arm themselves with pistols, rifles, shotguns, and other deadly weapons, and to unlawfully assault, intimidate, and drive away Negroes being employed at Spruce Pine and nearby points, unquote. Several of them entered guilty pleas, and Judge Findlay continued the cases to the November term for sentencing. At the end of the court session, Goss was taken back to the train station at Tokane for the trip back to Raleigh. Just a few people were at the station when he and the troops left. Following the trial, a heavy snow fell on Mitchell County in the early morning hours of October 23rd. The grand jury returned 79 true bills of indictment, naming the individuals that you see on the screen. Their cases were continued to the November session of Mitchell County Superior Court. You can pause the video if you desire to read these names. These 12 individuals escaped indictment when not true bills of indictment were returned on them by the jury. Now we move to Monday, November 12, 1923, the regular session of Superior Court in Mitchell County. These men pled guilty to the first and fourth counts in the original bills of indictment for inciting and participating in a riot. They received prayers for judgment for a period of three years upon condition that the defendants be law-abiding citizens with the right for the solicitor to move for judgment at any intervening term of the criminal court within three years if they violated terms of these prayers for judgment. Again, you can pause the video to read the names if you are interested. Peter Biddix, Stokes McKinney, C. E. McMahon, and Fate Ward had to pay a fine of $25, that's $432 in today's money, as part of their punishment, and Lane Buchanan had to pay a $10 fine, $173 in today's money, for his punishment. The five men mentioned previously were to be confined in the Mitchell County Jail for 12 months and assigned to work on the public roads of any county in the state. There is no record available to show if they served time in jail or if they performed work on the public roads. It was calculated that the cost of stationing the troops in Mitchell County for the riot was $10,000. That's approximately $173,000 in today's money. In a November 1, 1923 article in the Charlotte Observer, General Metz reported that since he became become Adjutant General in November 1919, troops had been used 11 times to protect African Americans who were on trial for crimes in North Carolina. Governor Morrison had dispatched the Guard eight of those times during his first 18 months in office. Of the eight African Americans receiving protection from the National Guard, four were eventually electrocuted for a crime. According to Metz, quote, The policy of rigid enforcement of the rights of the accused is believed to have averted at least three lynchings, while in five other cases, actual mob danger was relieved, unquote. Friday, November 30th, 1923 is Goss's execution date, and it was fast approaching. This first date was postponed for a week as Governor Morrison was going to be out of the state in New York and he had a policy that no man would be put to death while he was not in the state. Several had gathered at the state prison in Raleigh for the electrocution on November 30th and preparations for its completion had been made, but then word was given of the delay until December 7th, 1923 and the group dispersed. 
On Monday, December 3rd, 1923, there was one plea for Governor Morrison to spare Goss's life. It was made by Reverend M.C. Lunsford, the pastor of the Saluda Baptist Church of Saluda, North Carolina. Here is his letter. My dear Governor Morrison, if no one else will make a plea for clemency for redacted Negro, I will. I hope you can see your way clear to commute the sentence of this unfortunate Negro who became a victim to morbid and uncontrolled passion to life imprisonment. Your action in this matter would save a life and would give him years in which he might prepare to face the great judge of all men. The penitentiary would remove him from society where he would no longer be a menace. Fraternally, M.C. Lunsford, Pastor Saluda Baptist Church, White. Morrison took no action on the request. The stage was now set for the execution, and we'll take a look at the events surrounding it next. <laughs> 